Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming to this talk today. I think this will be very interesting to Google and to Googlers. Um, I'm going to do a short introduction before I turn it over. Um, Kenya Hara is an author, a graphic designer, professor at the Art Institute Musashino in Japan, and communication advisor for Muji. Uh, representing a new generation of designers in Japan, Kenya Hara uses long overlooked Japanese icons and images in much of his work. In his book, which um, some of you may know, Designing Design, he uh, stresses the importance of emptiness in both the visual and philosophical traditions of Japan and its application to design. Uh, for instance, he's designed uh, the opening and closing ceremonies for the Nagano Winter Olympics in 1998. In 2001, he enrolled as a board member for the Japanese label Muji and has considerably molded the identity of this successful corporation as communication and design advisor ever since. They recently opens, uh, opened a big store in New York you might have been to, and I, I heard, I overheard, that there's plans for San Francisco and other stores in the future. Uh, Kenyahara, alongside Naoto Fukasawa, one of the leading design personalities in Japan, has also called attention to himself with exhibitions such as Redesign, the daily products of the 21st century of 2000. His newest book is called Shiro, or White in, Japan, in uh, English, and he will be discussing this and uh, some ideas from this book and from his lectures. Uh, please help me introduce Kenya Hara. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kenya Hara. So I'm a designer based in Tokyo. So I work in communication design. I don't design things, though. I design happenings or mental events. I'm constantly thinking about how to create a memory or identity how to create a kind of spark of recognition in the mind of the audience. Something that will imprint itself as memory. Today, I'm going to talk about emptiness. Emptiness is the backbone of my aesthetic sensibility. The concept of emptiness is the implicit foundation of every aspect of Japanese culture. Architecture, design, communication, gardens, and lightings. At first sight, we might, we might confuse emptiness with the Western concept of simplicity but they are two completely different concepts. Today, I try to speak sort of free about emptiness. I'm going to focus on Japan a bit, but I suppose all culture is essentially local. I hope that you will be able to see my point from a global perspective. We can find the roots of emptiness in the sensibilities of the Japanese of the uh, distant past. They believed that wisdom lies in nature. Love of nature is universal, but we see the slight differences in beliefs. Who believes the nucleus of wisdom is within nature? and who believes it can be found within a human race. The ancient Japanese did not see nature as wild. They saw its abundance and believed that nature teaches a human being how to lead rich lives accordingly. When, the, when nature is identified as gods, with transcendental and special powers, religion is born. But in my talk today, I won't call this religion. I want to figure out 
how nature has supported mankind's spiritual strengths. I will look at liberals toward nature as a device that drives culture. In the distant past, Japanese saw kami, or gods, as a symbol of nature. Because these kind of gods are natural, it is hard to figure out where they are. With the wind, they fly over the mountain forest and the small villages, and yet they are also deep within the sea and the earth as well. Kami are in the tip of newly pulled daikon, daikon radishes. In the grain of rice, even Latin garbages. We say Yao Yorozu no Kami, which literally means eight million gods. To us, Kami or gods are infinite and ubiquitous. But there is no way to visit these gods. Nature is very fickle and delicate. So there is no way to make an appointment with the gods. The only things we can do is uh, invite the gods as guests. There is a curious type of structure in Japan that's common to us. It's called shiro. It's made of four pillars arranged in a square, with their tops joined by a straw rope. Inside this area, there is nothing. That is, it is empty. In fact, it is emptiness. If we create a condition of emptiness, the gods that are the forces of nature might come to feel it because emptiness is itself the possibility of being filled. The gods which see everything couldn't fail to notice the empty space. But that doesn't give us any certainty that they will enter. They may enter. This may carries great weight. What people pray for is the possibility. So it was in the ancient Japan that we first began understanding power as being made up of possibility and potential. When we put the roof on this shiro, the empty space that wandering gods just might, just might enter, it becomes a ya shiro. Ya means roof. This is how the center of the Shinto shrine is created. The structure of the shrine is like this. In the center, there is emptiness. Around it, there is a series of enclosures. The entry point, or tori, is a simple structure made up of two vertical posts and topped with a horizontal element. This symbolizes a gate of emptiness through which visitors must pass. Successive tori show the path from the entrance to the center of the shrine. And this is what shrine is. People visit the shrine and in its emptiness, they sense the existence of deity, convey their thoughts, and leave. 
This is the origin of a certain kind of Japanese communication. No logical word passed between the man and the gods, which are symbol of the nature's great power. There is no contract either. And yet, there is a sense of having communed with God through emptiness. That is good enough. It is because emptiness is vacant that it holds endless possibilities to receptive capacity. Emptiness is not a message but we can see the beginning of communication in the very act of seeing the possibility latent in an empty vessel and the conveying our thoughts or praying. To offer an empty vessel is to pose a single question and to be forever ready to accept, accept a huge variety of answers. Shinto's most holy site, the Ise Shrine to the Sun Goddess, had the same basic structure as other shrines. It embraced the central emptiness, which displays power in its potential to be filled. Ise Shrine seems to show the influence of Polynesian architecture. It is generally believed that the Roman culture arrived in China through the Silk Road, and Japan received in through China and Korea. But the Japanese archipelago on the tip of Asia is equally connected with the rest of the world through the ocean. That is, a greater or lesser extent, Japan has been influenced by cultures all over the world. And although Ise Shrine architecture shows the influence of Pacific or Polynesian architecture, over the space of the southern and some odd hundred years, its style has morphed into a truly Japanese one. The Ise Shrine is completely revealed every 20 years. And this means the lifespan of its yashiro, or roof to emptiness, is just 20 years. An empty lot is saved next to the existing yashiro so that the new one can be elected immediately adjacent to the old. More than a thousand ritual implements are also replaced with entirely new ones. Thus, the old building ceases to exist in the process of being dismantled. The blueprint is also redrawn every 20 years. It is important that the understanding is passed over to the next generation, not through the preservation of the original, but by duplication. Naturally, a physical difference will occur in the process of a redrawing, but redrawing is considered a very precise way to convey the tradition to the next generation. It is thought that the duplication information gains, in duplication, information gains a new life. In much the same way, construction methods, construction methods are handed down from one generation to the next. The master carpenter has assistants one of whom supervised the next rebuilding two decades later. I have heard that a master carpenter recites a certain spiritual charm 
at the ceremony of the rising of the flame. This charm has no linguistic meaning, but is claimed to be true copy of the original. The redrawing of the blueprint and the handing down of the building techniques are screens of thought, leading to the continual metamorphosis of the shrine's architecture. We see this in the gradual deviation from the original architecture style and in the wearing away of whatever linguistic meaning once belonged to the ceremonial charm. Suppose that you have a glass in each hand. One is empty and the other is filled with water. You pour water from the first glass into the empty glass. When you spill even a small amount, you add a new water to, pot, to top the glass up. If you repeat the process thousands of times, the water itself will become different from the original glass, original glass of water. But it is in the water that you will find what is eternal conveyed from the remote past. It might seem that act of passing emptiness from one, one hand to the other is hardly creative. However, it's much like the process by which human cells are altered through DNA replication. Just as in the cellular transformation by which human cells initiate their own restructuring and renovation, the building that once seems Polynesian has morphed into Japanese architecture. Emptiness wields great power in communication too. Normally, we think of communication as the delivery and the receipt of meaningful content. But it don't always need content. Since the essence of communication is to share information through thoughts or feelings with one another, eye contact can also be successful communication. It may not always be so, but if both parties feel they have shared something and created a band, it has been successful. We don't have to resort to the model in Claude Shannon's famous information theory, encoding and decoding signs to interpret meaning is a lot of work. In Japanese, this ideal communication is called aun no kokyu. Literally, this is a translated as the breath of alpha omega. At the gate of the Shinto shrines stands a pair of stone lion dogs. One has his mouth open as if he were exhaling, saying, ah. The other has his mouth closed as if he were inhaling, saying, mmm. The breath of Alpha Omega is uh, when one party dispatches a message and the other accepts it in the next breath. It is often said, the Japanese way of communicating is hard for non-Japanese to understand. Japanese people tend to make ambiguous remarks and are likely to omit the subject of a sentence, and otherwise speak in a non-committal way. 
Western communication tends to clearly define content and elicit the logical structure. Within this context, it's hard for Japanese people to be understood. When Japanese people make a decision on an important matter, they don't directly indicate their target, object, or situation. Instead, they leave the focal point unspoken and within the brackets. This is harnessing the potential of emptiness. Here is an example. Here, we see the chairman leading a discussion on matter X. He then asks his staff if they all agree to do whatever it is. When he, when he asks concerning this matter, do you all agree, agree to do it? And the staff all remain silent. <laughs> then the chairman concludes by saying, because you seem to be in complete agreement, let's take care of this matter in this way. In this example, you can see how concerned the speaker is to make the audience comfortable. The speaker completely avoids being direct by refusing name the urgent matter. The outcome is expressed as a pronoun it and that, and thus serves an, an empty vessel. It is silently approved, so everyone who has been included in the agreement process, and not just some special individual, and everyone shares equally the responsibility of the decision. Here, there's a specific mechanism of communication at work. Through, method, through a method that only those who are present can understand, the group implements emptiness, arrives at an agreement, and eludes the maldistribution of responsibility and power. This mechanism proceeds a solid agreement without filling in the blanks at the center, leaving it empty to accommodate change. Where two roads intersect, we need to install traffic lights that tell people when to go and when to stop. But when we use a roundabout, all the car can move along without stopping. This might not be the most accurate metaphor, but leaving the core of meaning empty helps us find a way to tactfully avoid any specific points or intersections. When we bracket out the important core, leaving the central space empty, we have to strive to attain a certain level of expertise or risk a misunderstanding about what's supposed to be inserted there. But the point of this mechanism is that it also including the, that possibility. It seems that this kind of consensus is a natural result of a quality group communication and excellent communication skills. Today, so much group, group communication going on through the internet. I think 
we should carefully reconsider and explore this kind of consensus building. The design of Japanese national flag has a red, has a red circle against a white background. The flag serves a good example for us to think about the essence of a symbol or emptiness. The red circle carries no meaning. The red circle is simply a red circle. No more and no less. It depends completely on the individual as to which meaning it carries, whether emperor, nation, or patriotism. A red circle attracts our eyes. If we endow this visual object with a particular meaning and put it in the circulation, we have effective visual communication. The red, red circle is an empty vessel. It's a receptacle for many meanings. This receptacle accepts meaning ranging from invasion, destruction, and imperialism to patriotism and peace. Because I'm of the post-war generation, I learned at school that the red circle symbolizes a peaceful nation. But whenever I've made these remarks to the university student audience in China, I've been greeted with confused murmurs or outright disapproval. There may be a laughter. I understand that there are those who doubt the propriety of my view. During World War II, the soldiers tied a kerchief around their forehead, bearing the red circle in the center, and participated in murderous attacks or were killed in the battlefield. When reflecting on this tragic fact, I'm tempted to say that disastrous cruelty once filled this red circle. But the relationship between symbol and meaning is always arbitrary. The interpretation, whether a nation, the sun, enthusiasm, or even red pickled, pickled pram in the center of a bowl of rice, depend on the, in, in, depend on the individual. Those who are told that it symbolizes peace see it as peace. But red cycle has no particular meaning. It's, complete, it's uh, completely up to the viewer. So the symbol of Japan is enormous emptiness that acts a receptacle for a great variety of some, some variety of a sometimes contradictory idea, which may be as different as sorrow and peace, humiliation and hope. Now, I just to talk a little about the, about the difference between simple and empty. They are uh, similar, but they are not the same. And when you think about it, you realize the concept of simplicity are only a very recent part of human history in the context of creating our environment. From the ancient times, the human has represented and understood important qualities like meaning, power, and beauty in the forms and features of extravagant decoration and elaboration, not in simplicity. 
from the Azan world and Bronze Ware age until recently, the huge powers of dominance in China and in India, in the religious art of Islam, and in the absolute monarchs of Europe. Most of humanity has put a great effort into imprinting object with a whole host of intricate patterns. These elaborated patterns were a symbol of great authority. But it's been less than 150 years since humans started seeing value and aesthetic in simplicity. When dominating power began to collapse and individual goals were encouraged, that is, a modern society began to grow, people began to admire the rationality of simplicity and minimalism. When people have a choice, which they do in modern society, they choose a rational, which is beautiful to them because it represents an effective use of their labor and resources. The course of modern design has followed the discovery of simplicity, which conform to function. But it was late 15th century, several hundred years before Western modernism, when the, when the Japanese began to value and find beauty in simplicity. And what they found pleasing was a concept of emptiness, which is different from the simplicity that was later discovered by modernism. Take a look at this map. Here, Eurasia is tilted 19 degrees. And Japan is on the eastern tip of Asia. If this were the cabinet or a patching game, which is a kind of upright pinball machine, <laughs> the Japanese archipelago would be on the bottom where the ball ends its trip. Vast stretches of ocean lies behind the archipelago. Balls falling from Rome find their way to Japan at, least, at last, mainly passing through the countries and the cities along the Silk Road or by a Russia, or perhaps through the Marine Silk Road. Like pachinko ball, culture takes many paths, and Japan has received nuggets of culture by way of various places across Eurasia. In fact, Japan has accepted cultures of all kinds. Japanese culture has been influenced not only by China and Korea, but also by Russia and Polynesia. On the other hand, it seems that being constantly exposed and becoming familiar with various cultures, Japan has actually led to a sensibility to ultimate plainness that is liberated from all cultural styles. We don't find this kind of simplicity and plainness in other Eastern Asian regions or countries. On the contrary, their visual expression is characterized by unique elaborate patterns and decoration. Around the middle of the 15th century, Japan experienced a civil war called Onin no Ran. This conflict resulted 
in the disappearance of the most of the cultural assets that had been accumulated. The shogun of that time, Yoshimasa Ashikaga, was a connoisseur of art. He was deeply upset by the loss of these assets. Eventually, Yoshimasa handed power over to his son and retired in the Higashiyama area of Kyoto. Yoshimasa passed the time cultivating his taste for calligraphy, the tea ceremony, and so on. The culture that flourished around him was called Higashiyama culture. So, although the culture was reset by the disaster of the Oni no Ran, this new aspect of culture born in, in Higashiyama rejuvenated it. The Japanese fine art that come to be during this period carries a tint of emptiness. This might have been due to uh, recurring images in the mind of those who experienced the original loss, including Yoshimasa. This may have affected their perception. Finally, liberated from the influence of the diverse foreign cultures that has arrived and been accepted, Japan began to surge forward, developing a common aesthetic sensibility of emptiness. Yoshimasa spent a lot of time in the study called Dojinsai at the Kyoto Jisho Temple. That study is the origin of what we, we think of as a traditional Japanese style room. I think it is a very simple but beautiful space enveloped in a comfortably tense atmosphere. What do you think of it? Its floor is covered with tatami mat, and the lighting platform is set in front of the paper-covered translucent shoji sliding doors. When the doors are opened, a clear-cut, neat landscape garden appears. To the light of the platform are also shoji doors, while on the other two sides are sides uh, husuma or sliding partitions. All the conditions for traditional Japanese style room are condensed into this space. Shuko, the founder of the tea ceremony, was on friendly terms with Yoshimasa and often visited him in his study. The tea ceremony called Chanoyu is one of the important influence on the cultivation of aesthetic simplicity. The highly talented and intelligent Shuko designed an aesthetic exemplified by Wabi. We identified this as a taste for the simple, transient, and quiet. Wabi transcended the influence of foreign cultures that value flamboyance. Shuko and Yoshimasa enjoyed studying, uh, enjoyed sharing the fruits of their rich imagination in this kind of space. The tea ceremony soon culminated in a particular aesthetic led by Senno Rikyu. Because the space is designed to be empty, its visitors can invite an imagined scene to enter. The concept of the ceremony, or tea ceremony, 
is to invoke a variety of images with creative power, then transform them into communicative power by accepting them into this emptiness. In the day of Rikyu, a tea house was diminished in size and simplified. The utensils were limited to include just a tray and a tea bowl and the object used in flower arranging. Furthermore, the sequence of action was refined and then also arranged for the most rational demonstration of a good face between the partners. The essence of the ceremony is a facilitation of mutual understanding. This is accomplished by the master entertaining the guest in the extremely minimal, financialist space of a tea room. Flowers displayed in the alcove are the single hanging scroll, single hanging scroll indicate the tenor of each individual ceremony. For example, the master may fold the base within the water and spread the petals of cherry blossom on its surface. This way, he and his guests share the illusion of sitting together under a cherry tree in full bloom. The guest's interpretation of the master's production and the guest's part's perception, even completion of the master's intended message is called mitate. Mitate is a metaphor for tangible interaction. It is a reaction that plays an important role in the ceremony. It is a creative act of filling the emptiness with an image or meaning. Emptiness works only with approach of mitate. And you see, a barely furnished tea house allows for all sort of imagined scenes. A tea house can assume different forms. It may be a spot beneath a, a blossoming cherry tree, or it may become the seashore left by the waves of the ocean. The garden and the passage leading to the tea house are where the guest is given access from the ordinary to the extraordinary. His senses are awakened with his stroll through the manicured garden. Once endowed with these exquisite senses, the guest will not miss even the slightest change. Now he is invited into the tea house. With a minimum amount of the information, he will still have the resources to conjure, conjure up eloquent images. Here are, here are Riku, the tea practitioners, Riku. Here are Riku's seven guidelines. Flowers as if they are growing in the field. The charcoal fire ready to boil the water precisely at the time the tea is served. Cool in summer, warm in winter. Early preparation. Preparation for the unexpected. Wholehearted attention to the guests. That's it, you might think. But did he was hold infinite interpretations? Take the first rule, for instance. Flowers as if they are growing in the field, but the act of flower arranging itself is artificial. So 
It is impossible to arrange, arrange them as if they were growing in the field. No one can even get close this goal. However, if we apply the rule in a wider sense, setting all living things, ourselves included, as a part of the field and the flowers, this simple line resonates with a whole range of aphorism, guiding us to strive, strive to use our discretion in making harmony with nature in all its forms. The tea ceremony refers to the hospitality that the master shows to his guests by serving tea, but in fact, it is meant as a metaphor for all human activity. Therefore, Likyu's word creates an environment for encouraging encouraging various mitates, various creative reactions to human activity, which fill emptiness with meaning. In the tea ceremony, a principle, a principle of emptiness is at work. It serves well as a resource of ideas that communicate with and unites any of the vast range of possible situation, either among people or between the person and the object. Here you will see Dojin Sai study I mentioned earlier. There is a white ball in the photo. That is a Muji product. I'm sure you understand why the ball is in the study. The Muji concept is rooted in the concept of the tea ceremony. Behind Muji's think thinking is the idea of applying the simplicity of the products as emptiness. This clearly connects the concept of Muji and the tea ceremony. For example, the Muji table is concise, that is, it is empty. Both the 18 year olds starting out in life alone and the couple in their 60s think that that is a perfect fit. This very broad range of capacity defines Muji quality. Muji products are universal, both in use and context. And this is the difference between the simple and empty. Here are two well-made simple tools. The Western style knife has a perfect finger grip. The Japanese style knife, no. At first glance, the design of the gripless knife, gripless knife seems to lack common courtesy to the user. But it is within this universality the user can hold it from any angle. That we, we found emptiness. In this emptiness, that allows for the extremely skill of the chef at the traditional Japanese restaurant. The functional knife with a finger grip is simple. That hocho, the Japanese traditional knife, is empty. Do you understand the difference between this? Okay. Muji was founded in 1980. During Japan's golden economic decade, when gorgeous objects flood the country. Within the Muji concept, 
is the idea of discovering within simplicity a luxury that rivals mere appearance. Muji refrains from launching messages even in advertising. Instead, the company intends to facilitate communication by publishing ads that are like empty vessel, allowing multiple interpretations. Take a look at this poster as an example. Pictured here are just us and a human being. There is nothing, yet everything. Muji's next challenge is how to make an emptiness born in Japan function in a global context. Here is a message from a brand. Here are Muji's. I'm sure that everyone here, through his or her work, is already aware of the meaning of emptiness. To create is not just produced object or phenomena. Coming up a question is also creation. In fact, a question that has a huge receptive capacity doesn't even need a definitive answer. The very essence of a question is its, is its power to elicit the possibilities or reply, to trigger a variety of, to trigger a variety of thoughts. Questioning is emptiness. The total quantity of thoughts triggered by questioning is what matters most. I entreat you not to produ produce more, but to think more. I believe that the richness of that thinking may very well be the critical resources to giving this world a future. In conclusion, it is my hope that I have been able to share with you the idea of emptiness as a creative receptacle. Thank you very, thank you very much for kind attention. Uh, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, we had a sign-up that went around for books, and for people who signed up, we'll be handing those out. Um, that'll be the end of the program, but if you have any questions, feel free to come up and talk to Mr. Hara. Thank you very much.